Um, thanks very much for coming, for joining. Um, my name is Christoph Pettis. Um, I'm the CEO of PostgreSQL Experts. We're a small consultancy in Alameda, California, uh, which is near San Francisco, but not quite as cool. Um, there's our company website, Hire Us to Do Things. There's my personal website. Um, these slides will be on this website, thebuild.com. Email address, Twitter account. Okay, so if you run a Postgres um, server in production, this will happen to you. Um, data corruption is inevitable, like, uh, like the poor. Um, sooner or later, something bad will happen. The good news is it's really easy to recover from corruption. First step is you restore from the last known good backup. Second step is you receive the praise of a grateful nation. And it's time for coffee. Okay, any questions? Um, oh, um, you don't have a known good, oh. Or, that's a shame. Um, set, and even good backups can have hidden long-term corruption or be too old. You know, uh, if you're a busy e-commerce site, your five-month-old backup is probably not going to do it for you. Or you might be hit by a <coughs> Postgres bug. Um, so let's talk about preventing corruption, finding corruption, fixing corruption, if you can. So the best kind of corruption is the one is the kind you didn't have because you prevented it. Um, Postgres is very trusting. Um, it basically assumes the underlying file system is perfect. That if you write a sector out, if, or sector, or <laughs> you can tell how old I am, call them sectors. Next I'm gonna talk about drums. Um, the, that the underlying file system is perfect. So it can't reco it recover from any silent, uh, bad silent data write unless you're very lucky. Unless that, for some reason, that hit didn't occur in a uh, uh, part of the, uh, the record that Postgres needed. So if you are using 9.3 and later, which you should be, and if you're using checksums, which you should be, you at least get a warning that the, the uh, um, data that came back is not the data that expected, was expected. So use them. Turn them on. Um, it is a shame that they are not on by default currently, and I don't believe they're on by default in 10 either. Um, so the, the other bad news is once you created it, you're stuck. So you, um, you have to recreate the database and PG dump restore into it or something like that. So that's a shame. Or use logical replication to replicate to a new one. Hardware is cheap. Data is expensive. Use good quality hardware. And be sure your uh, hardware properly honors F-Sync end-to-end. This is a remarkably common occurrence that even really expensive SANs don't, um, don't honor it. One of the, my favorite things to do with a sales engineer on a SAN, it, the, the sandbox is they'll talk about how it's battery backed up and wonderful and all that and say, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna write pseudo-random data. It's pseudo-random so we can reconstruct it. You give it the seed to really huge files and then I'm gonna walk over and pull out the plug and watch the blood drain from the sales engineer's face. And this is for a sand that costs more than my house did. So, um, and I live in the Bay Area. Um, so the lack of this is more common than you think. So make sure it honors this and make sure you have a proper power redundancy and things like that. Avoid network attached devices for PG data, the actual data, data volume and its table spaces and all that stuff, and backups. There's an unfortunate um, trend I've noticed where people will network mount, uh, where there'll be a network mount like slash backup local to the system that, and all the back backups are done with copy or rsync or things like that. It seems really nice, but if something run, runs wild on the database server, that's just a local volume as far as it's concerned. It can crunch that as easily as it can crush anything else. And backup everything all the time. You can never have too many backups. In fact, I just recently validated my backup strategy when an unfortunate coffee incident occurred on my laptop a couple of weeks ago, and I lost a file, which was short. So good backup strategy matters. Um, you know, which, what only exists on one drive you not, do not truly possess. Um, uh, be sure to follow the right backup protocol for your technique. It's very easy if you're using homegrown backups for, P, uh, for Postgres to get the backup, to get something a little bit wrong and have that one missing wall file if you're doing point in time backups. Um, you know, don't, you forgot to do the start backup and you didn't get all the wall files or something like that. And test your backups. This is really important. Be, if you haven't tested the backup, you don't know it works. If you don't know it works, it's not a real backup. Um, one of my favorite things to do is prime developers to workstations nightly 
with, um, with, from the backup because you'll find out really fast if it's broken. Um, one thing I like to do is once in a while, I just like to do a PG dump to dev null on the whole database. Because if you have a 12 terabyte database, you probably haven't read every single um, block of that entire database recently. So do that. It doesn't get indexes because PG dump doesn't get indexes, but it does get all the data pages. And it's, am it's amazing when you're running one of these and then suddenly it just errors out in, an early, in a part of a, a table that's never been touched for a long time. It reads every single row in the database, not including indexes, but it's very good for finding lurking corruption. Of course, if you can save the dump file, do it. If you have a you know, 200 terabyte database, this may not be practical. Um, you can also use PG stat tuple um, which is to do this kind of scan. And the nice part of one is that does, does do indexes. This is not zero perform, performance hit, of course. It is gonna you know, drag everything through your file system cache and things like that. So you know, pick an appropriate time to do it. So why is there corruption? You know, why is there evil in the world? Um, so hardware failures, underlying storage failure. Sometime, you know, pop out, get the data sheet on one of your hard drives. You know, go to Seagate.com and download it and do the multiplication that they don't do of how many uncorrected sectors per million sectors there are on that drive times the number of sectors on that drive. And you'll come up with a number somewhere around 100, which means there are 100 sectors that if you write out the data and read it back in, you get something different, uncorrected and unchecked. Oh, hmm, that's interesting. So next time you look at one of your uh, a three terabyte drive at, that's 80% full, there's corruption on that drive you don't know about. Um, the bad, this could be bad, bad controller. Um, garbage rights during power loss, real common. Uh, battery backup that didn't. Um, for example, how, if you have battery backup in one of, in a, um, on a RAID controller or a sandbox, how do you know that battery is still good? Because after four years, it's probably not. Bad RAM, especially if you have non-ECC RAM, which you know desktop quality machines often don't. Um, hardware features, um, deferred or entirely missing F-sync behavior, because um, disable not having proper F-sync behavior will, um, uh, will, will um, very much flatters benchmark results. And of course, the, the the argument is well, but we have battery backup, and we have this, and we have that, and we have all these things, and if it works end to end, that's great. Um, Network attached storage that doesn't, that, where the disconnect is not graceful, um, that can cause you know either metadata problems in the file system or something like that. Um, and if you're using SoftRaid, their SoftRaid software it has bugs. Of course, SANS have software and bugs. Um, and sadly, Postgres bugs. Um, 9.2 and 9.3 had a, some unfortunate replication bugs. The good news is these aren't common. It's usually not the first, the first thing to think of is, oh, well, I got a corrupt sector, Postgres must have a bug, but they do happen. Who's running 9.6.1? Check the release notes on 9.6.2. You might. <laughs> um, operator error, very, this is unfortunately extremely common. Uh, backups that don't include critical files, the O, oh, we had table spaces thing. Um, back, you know, it's, I've, I've been called in to fix problems where they had four table spaces and we're backing up three of them. Um, backups that don't follow a protocol. Good reason not to grow your, not to roll your own backup strategy if you can possibly avoid it. Use a tool. Um, and uh, I've done this. I'm not proud of it, but I have done it. Um, Bungled attempts at problem recovery. Um, unfortunately, this can be really, really common. Um, or you delete the wrong files to free space. The infamous PG underscore X log thing, which is the reason in 10 it's the names being changed. Uh, who heard about this? The GitLab incident. Yes, this is how panicking can make a bad situation worse. They, their backup strategy was sound and they did everything right, right up until they had to recover and they forgot which one was the primary and which one was the secondary. And the TLDR on it is they recovered the bad's primary over the good secondary. So this is, um, this is, why, you make, this is why you write everything down before you have to do it, when it's three in the morning and you're panicked. So what do you do? So buy good hardware, to demand your cloud provider do so, or have multi-tier redundancy, ideally all of these, um, have backups and test them, and stay up on Postgres releases and read the release notes. Okay, so with all of that, yet corruption happens. So what do you do? 
the first rule is save all the parts. Stop Postgres, do a file, full file system level backup. Keep that backup safe. Work on a copy. Make changes methodically and document what you did. It is really bad to be halfway through one of these recoveries at three in the morning and went, oh my God, where am I? What am I doing? You know, why, why did I choose this career? Um, <laughs> the, um, which you know, I think about frequently in these situations. Storage space is extremely inexpensive. No matter how big your data is, have enough storage space to make a full file system level copy. Yes, if you have a one petabyte database, this still applies to you. The re everybody is about to give, think of a reason why you can't buy enough storage space. You're all wrong. Buy the storage space. If you can't afford, if you can't afford double the storage space, you can't afford your database. Um, the most kind of common kind of corruption we run into is index corruption because indexes have a lot more structure, internal structure than the data does. Um, the easiest thing to do is you drop the index in a transaction and see if that fixes the problem. It very frequently does. If it does, then just rebuild the index. That's nice. Um, if it doesn't, that's probably not index corruption. Um, in Postgres 10, there's a new module, a uh, contrib module, AM check, to detect malformed indexes. Um, you can also get it from GitHub, from Peter Gigan's repo for pre-10. Um, it doesn't repair the corruption, it just tells you where it is, but that's what the re-index or create index concurrently commands are for. Bad data page. Um, you see the errors in the log. By the way, one thing that's really, really important to do is the, all those text logs that are choking your disk, read them, run them through PG Badger and look at the summaries because there's nothing worse than realizing that for the last five months it's been complaining about a corrupt data page and you didn't know about it. Um, can you do a PG dump? Can you just dump that one table and see if, um, and get any errors? Because it reads every row of the, main, of the data, not the indexes, so the output should be clean. Um, if, if it is a single, <laughs> you know, we're, um, I stand by the advice. You can, um, one is you, um, turn this on and see if you can and see if you can do if it makes the problem go away. The problem isn't really gone away, but you have lost data at this point. Yeah, <laughs> we're if if the, if this if you could have restored from a known good backup, we wouldn't be at this slide. Um, really bad data pages. Um, this is like the back end crashes when you try to touch them. Um, can you select around them? You know, do the, you know, crawl your way inwards until you isolate them. Um, do copy out of the, of the uh, good data, drop the table, copy back in. Um, or do a create table from the select, renaming appropriately. Um, delete, you can sometimes just delete the bad rows by C CTID if you can isolate them. Sometimes a delete will work where a select won't. Um, usually because of uh, usually because it's trying to decompress the page and the, the data and it isn't working. Um, a very a great technique um, is you can iterate through the rows in PL, um, PLPGSQL with an exception block around the select because you can catch the, the error and keep on going rather than just stop when it hits the bad row. Um, catch and log any rows that throw the exception. Um, this is very handy for finding toast corruption. Very frequently, the primary data structure will be fine, but the, to but the toast table will have a, a hit uh, um, in it. Um, and you do, a, you do a select of the whole table and everything looks fine, but your application is getting errors because the, just the select star of the, of the primary structure isn't uncompressing the toast data. So you uh, go through and do that stuff. Okay. And sometimes all of this doesn't work and things are really badly screwed up. Um, the problem with corruption is, by its nature, it's a one-off situation. You know, the, the universe is not nice enough to hand us like the five types of corruption that can happen. Um, so be sure to, if you can, to the extent possible, determine the extent of it before continuing, and be sure you can step backwards because all of these things will require you to modify the underlying data, frequently destroying data in the process because you're trying to recover as much as you can out of your database. So you want to make sure you can get back to where you were. And the bad news is there are no recipes. And remember, work on a copy. Um, so first thing is, are there, you know, if you're dealing with fundamentally broken hardware, you probably want to fix that problem first. Like, are there errors at the system level saying that there are bad sectors and things like that? Um, is the own killer terminating back ends? Um, so find that out in dmessage or syslog. Um, are you getting disk IO errors? Um, 
can you actually copy the whole thing to dev null? You know, cp-r the whole thing to dev null and see if it can read every sector in the inside of PG data. Um, if you have these really bad data pages where the back end crashes when you touch them, you can, you can if necessary, I'm not giving you the formula here because I don't want to encourage this behavior, but um, you can isolate the pages and use dd to zero them out because a, an all zero page is an empty page from Postgres when it tries to read it. Um, and if you do this, you're going to have to recreate all the indexes. Ideally, you're going to PG dump the whole thing to a new database. Um, so this is, the, this is the thing that happens. You went on vacation, the system ran out of disk space, and they, you, they call you to say that Postgres won't start now. Um, whole questions at the end. Um, we, um, we just deleted some log files. Which ones? Yeah. So <laughs> this is why it's PG wall. Um, so yay for Postgres 10 that, they, that we're renaming it. Just, just to be clear, people always laugh when this happens, but laugh while you can because it's common enough we broke compatibility with all these tools just to prevent it from happening in the future. It's really common that people do this. Um, so you're missing one of these wall files in Postgres won't start. Well, you, could, you pull out this big hammer labeled PG um, reset xlog and whack the database with it. Because um, what this does is it tells it, it tells Postgres, you know those wall files you, you, you think you need? You don't need them. They're fine. You're, everything's cool. Um, so you can get the server to start. The problem is there's a high risk of, inc of inconsistent or corrupt data here. So check the database very thoroughly, PG dump it, because you're probably going to have a lot more cleanup to do after this, but you can at least get it started. Um, PGC log corruption. This is this, you know, the, everybody talks about PG underscore X log, and then there's this little other directory called PGC log, which actually causes more trouble. Um, who's seen error messages like this? I know I have. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, the, uh, so corruption. The good news is it's really subtle. You usually get a bunch of errors like this, as, but and subtle, uh, so you can you can see the see them in the log. Um, either a file's missing or it's truncated. Um, you can replace a missing file with an all zeros file. It always makes me a little alarmed when I get a message that says, "Oh well, we googled this up and this is what we did. Was that okay?" Because they obviously didn't understand the ramifications. Because what they've done is, is um, what PG, the PGC log files are, they record, is a bitmap, a double bitmap, that records the status of all the, of the, of the, the interesting set of transactions for Postgres right now. Um, zero, zero means in progress. It means there's been a begin but not a commit. So if you zero these out, it means previously committed um, or rolled back transactions can, um, are suddenly now in progress. So be prepared to do more cleanup because your database is going to be in a somewhat awkward state. Um, the nightmare scenario here is system catalog corruption. Is one of the, one of the PG underscore um, catalogs has been hit. It's very hard to recover from because you can't, uh, Postgres can't interpret the data pages without the catalog. There isn't enough redundant information. Um, so probably you want to call what you know, do 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 a quick search on uh, a Google search and pick one of us and have it recover to recover it. Okay, now I'll, actually I'll take questions now. There was one back there. Good. Yeah, sure. What? Um, there's a tool PG Rescue that you can use to reread the data and see if it uh, see if that works. Sure. Why not? You know. Your, it's, it's your business at stake. You might as well take a little bit of extra effort. So, okay, yeah. Is there a way to find toast corruption ahead of time? Um, well, you can, what you can do is go through and select out the, make sure you select, retrieve the actual column values so it decompresses them all. Um, and, you know, often uh, if you're writing a PLPGSQL script, what you can do is search through it, read out the individual variables, and like what I often do is like do a, if it's a text variable, which is the usual case on Toast or JSON, um, you can select like the 2,000, you know, the, the 4,000th to 5,000th character into the, using the substring operation, because you're guaranteed it'll read it out of the Toast structure and decompress it. The main reason Toast, t you often don't see Toast data is the particular query you're doing doesn't require it to, de to decompress it from the Toast structure so it doesn't. Okay. Anything else before I plow on? Highly caffeinated here. Yeah. Uh, in your experience, what file system uh, 
better suits for uh, PostgreSQL and has less error and uh, which uh, rate do you prefer, hardware one, software one? I prefer hardware rate to software rate, although really all rate is software rate, it's just where the software runs. Um, the, um, I don't notice any corruption difference between XFS and the, um, between XFS between XFS and um, EXT4. Um, there's a mostly the the res if you look for a paper by Tom, a talk by Thomas Vondra who did some benchmarking of it. There's performance. There's some interesting performance difference characteristics, but in terms of corruption, they seem equally reliable. ZFS does have the nice characteristic that it checksums, so you don't have to. Um, the, the downside of ZFS is that it's a little, that it's not, you, it's not just, you know, MKFS, MKFS dash ZFS. <laughs> you know, there's a little more tuning and um, Sean Chittenden, is he in the room? No, no, he's gonna be talking at the same time. Of course he's not. Talk to him about writing it. He has a very good talk about that he gave it scale. Yeah? No, I, um, I, I, um, I think it's fine. If, if the underlying file system does checksum and recovery and bad block recovery, which every file system world should, but not that many do, you don't need to use Postgres checksums. Okay, so some, here we go. So here was the problem. These errors were flying out of Postgres. Um, the particular situation that caused this scenario was the network connectivity was bad between the primary, uh, the secondary, and caused it to be promoted to the primary. Uh, the new secondary couldn't handle the load. This is one reason that if you're planning to use the secondary for failover, make sure it can keep up with your production load. Um, so they initialized a new primary um, from the secondary, but when they started up the new secondary, uh, the the now primary, um, on these. Um, started up, all these errors started flying out. That doesn't look good at all. Um, the problem is, the network problems hadn't gone away, so when they were R-syncing to create the new, um, the new server, it had network problems too. And everyone was scrambling to get this new primary back online because the, the secondary was being crushed by the traffic, so no one noticed the fact that these errors were flying out because literally no one scrolled back to see them. Um, the good news is the C log file was still available. On the secondary, we could drop it into place. So yay, problem solved. Uh, we were very lucky that C log file was available because the very next step would have been to destroy the old secondary and recreate it from the primary. And had not been, had these errors gone unnoticed, we would have, it would have been missing. So this is, the moral of the story is no matter how bad a disaster is, rushing makes it worse. You know, there's a, a, um, a problem plus rushing is what creates crises. Just make sure you are not introducing new problems as you're repairing old ones. Okay. Horrible problem. These errors started flying out. Queries failing. So how did we get here? A new, uh, new primary provision by promoting from a secondary, and these errors started popping out almost immediately. But only on one row, on one table. Hmm. And only on some queries, not every query. Isolating the record using the primary key was fine. The record retrieved just fine. Huh, okay, that's weird. Re-index the toast table? Nah, that didn't solve it. But if we iterated through the table using PLPGSQL, we found it. Uh, the problem is there were two levels of corruption. There was a bad toast entry and two rows with the same primary key. Oops. Um, one pointed at the bad row, and the index scans only found the good row. Okay. Uh, but the sequential scans found both, and horrible things happened, specifically that error. Um, so th in this case, we were able to solve it just by deleting the, the missing row by CTID. Um, we iterated through everything else, found no corruption, rebuild the indexes, fine. Read the release notes is the moral here because it was, this was actually caused by a Postgres bug. Um, but the hosting provider, hated, ahem, uh, hadn't upgraded Postgres. Yes. Um, so, yeah, this is every consultant's nightmare scenario. You do the job, you go away, you, you, uh, you, know, you cash the check, everything's fine, and then you get the call. So how do we get here? Um, a new primary was provisioned by promoting from a secondary. Um, the new primary was put into uh, service, old primary decommissioned, everything was fine, everything looks fine for a few hours until there's missing data. Ooh, that's bad. And some rows are duplicated. It almost looked like an old and new from an update had both committed, it's like, which is impossible, of course, and there were no error messages. Everything was running fine. Well, except for the fact that there was bad data. 
um, Postgres bug in this case, um, since fixed. Um, the problem was under high, um, under high write load conditions, C log values weren't being pr uh, transmitted from the primary to the secondary. And this was an extremely high write rate database, one of the highest ones I personally worked on. So it showed the bug where otherwise, where, where other installations didn't. So some were rolled back, some weren't. It was just awful. Um, the good news is there was enough in, um, metadata within the database itself at the application level to delete the bad rows and co copy the missing ones from the old database. Um, we wrote some handcrafted scripts to do that, which I never ever want to do again. That was a really horrible day. Um, so don't exclude that it can be a Postgres problem, because they do happen. Um, and do a thorough sanity check on promoted primaries before you decommission, before you put it into commission, because this was not a subtle problem. I unwisely assumed that because there were no errors flying out, everything was pro worked properly, but it was not, but even, even a cursory check, like a count star from the various tables would have shown that there was an issue. And um, fortunately, they were very sympathetic about this because they understand that I didn't sell them Postgres. Um, so that, which was, um, <laughs> so fortunately, they did not blame me personally for it. Yeah, so one of these scenarios. Um, we get this call, they had a database running on desktop hardware, absolutely critical to the, to, the, um, to the office. Nothing could happen. It was literally 5 p.m. on a Friday. And the, it, it, was des it was cheap desktop hardware and it did not for sync. And there was a power failure and the UPS hadn't been tested for a while, so the battery was dead. Um, so Postgres started up correctly, but back end crash when touching certain tables. Bang, seg fault, all done. Um, and these tables were central to the application. There was, the data was absolutely required. Um, basically, so, uh, during, during it right, d garbage was spewed out over about four tables, and the sequences, interestingly enough, also got corrupted at the same time. Um, you couldn't do a system-wide PG dump, and to find the damaged tables and the parts of them, you really had to go through it like, select crash, oh, that didn't work. Select crash, that didn't work. Um, so we did a schema only dump to get a blank database because that did work. Thank goodness the system catalogs were fine. We dumped the undamaged tables and there was an old but still useful backup um, of the tables because the good news is while they were critical tables, they weren't very frequently modified. There were things like email templates and stuff like that. Um, so we had to write some hand, handcrafts and transformation scripts because the old backup, because since then a new version of the application had shipped and the schema was different. but. Fortunately, we were able to bang it into shape. And we just manually reset the dead, the dead sequences. So if, you're, if your business relies on it, maybe buy good hardware. Um, better hardware would have cost a lot less than we charged them to fix this problem. Um, and you're never too small to have a secondary. At least run WALL-E or something like that, because that would have, that would have uh, solved the problem. And in this case, even this old horrible backup, which was useless from, as a pure re a restore, was we were able to get them online. So even really old backups can be useful in a, one of these emergencies. Okay, yeah, one of these. So yeah, this is this um, client said. Well, there were too many auto vacuums going on, so we just set max, uh, auto vacuum max H to two billion. Vacuum freeze table age to, uh, to 1 billion, and now the auto vacuum jobs go away. We're so smart, we Googled it. Um, and then on Halloween, um, I get this call that these wraparound warnings were appearing in the log. But they weren't monitoring the logs very closely, because who has time to read all of that stuff? By the time they noticed, unfortunately, it was too late, because Postgres was generating transactions too faster than it could, we could um, vacuum the tables. So uh, it hit shutdown mode. Um, who's ever seen this, a single user shutdown mode? Yeah, you never want to see this. It's really bad on a big database. Um, so first we had to, so Postgres, because when Postgres reaches a certain transaction ID age, it will shut down and only start up in single user mode um, and require that you, vac that you manually vacuum the database, which on a big database can take a while. So um, by the way, this was on Halloween, and this, uh, this particular client, was relate, um, their, their business was related to US elections. So this, there was a little bit of stress here. Um, so we had to manually vacuum the oldest tables to get the database online. And then we were able to get it back into production, and then um, 
manually vacuum in about 12 wide uh, auto vacuum, um, which of course cre uh, created a huge amount of I/O. And on Slack, they're always saying, "Is there anything we can do to reduce the I/O?" And I was just like, co "Copy paste, no return, no return, no return." You know, so you just have to be prepared to deal with the very high I/O that all these auto vacuums are generating. Um, so don't do this. Don't crank up the auto vacuum free settings unless you do manual vacuums. Um, the mon and monitor, 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 because Postgres was warning about this for a long time, well before they reached the point that it was hopeless. And don't just kill these auto vacuum freeze jobs thinking you'll deal with it later. Um, this is unfortunately very common behavior. So, in sum, get good hardware. Test your backups. This is very important. Restore them to a test system and look at them. Do this regularly. Um, if you can find a way of doing it on an automated basis, by all means do this. I'll refresh your staging systems from it. Um, stay, up on the, the, um, stay up on the news and apply upgrades promptly. You should always be subscribing to PG Announce and actually read the stuff that's in it. And monitor your log output. Because um, I like to you know, use PG Badger. Um, run the logs through daily on things like that and just get in the habit of always going to the events tab and looking at the summary. If nothing else, you sometimes find interesting application bugs, like if you find 200,000 duplicate key violations, were you actually expecting that? You know, was that something, you know, maybe you're doing optimistic inserts and that's okay. Maybe this is uh, surprising. And get plenty of rest, because one of these things will happen at the worst possible time. <laughs> and thank you. Any questions? Yes, sir. Well, it depends on your working environment. I like to refresh staging from them. That's my, that's my favorite way. You can also um, distribute them to developers in an automated fashion to, um, for their development environment. The one concern there is you sometimes have to come up with an auto way, automated way of masking data. Because if it has, you know, if you're like doing health records or something that you, you're not going to hand out to everybody. Um, generally, but feeding them back into an earlier stage in the development pipeline is, uh, is one of my favorite ways of doing it. Because just doing the restore is fine, but, you, but uh, if you haven't fired up the server and used the data, sometimes there can be problems that you wouldn't otherwise know. But for example, the restore could complete, would um, complete correctly, but you're missing a table space, for example. Um, if you're doing a PITR style backup, there are subtle ways that the things could be wrong that, that Postgres will refuse to start up, but just doing the restore operation looks like it completed fine. Hi. I, I highly recommend uh, running PG test F sync on your hardware. Today. Yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, because th that will give you an idea of whether or not it actually does what it claims to do. And, and really do, and if you're in the pro, if you're value, buying hardware, drill the, them on what, uh, don't accept, oh yes, it's fine as an answer. Uh, get details on how they handle this and do plug pull tests. It's, especially if you're a software engineer and you're like, kind of like, hard, hardware failures are one of these things that are, uh, that are like the universe, suddenly, like electromagnetism suddenly not working, you know? We're, we're not used, if, as a software engineer, the idea the CPU could be bad is like this incredibly scary thing to me. But if you're specking out hardware, literally do plug pull tests because I've never had a data center work one, have a completely 100% clean switch from grid to local power. So, you know, pull out the, um, you know, do, do that kind of stuff. And if the vendor doesn't like that idea, that's interesting data. Yes, sir. Uh, there's somebody here with a question. Oh, yeah, I was actually just going to say in response to what I said, in my talk at one, I will be talking about ways to integrate backups into sort of a whole life cycle. Yes. So it is part of your entire process rather than being a freight off to the side. You want to be comfortable with it. One, one thing I highly recommend, by the way, is if, unless you're really, really comfortable with doing this and you have a whole system admin infrastructure, don't do your own backup scripting. Just get one of the package tools. Use Rep Manager, use Backrest, use one of those guys. Use Wally. -E. Yeah. So I have two questions. One is, uh, how do you arrange to conduct a bug pull test before buying hardware? Mm -hmm. And the second is, uh, what do you do if you've got a customer who has existing hardware uh, and you're not sure whether it will corrupt their data if you pull the plug. In the first, in the first one, buy returnable hardware, is what I, is what I do. You know, is like say is, is you know because when you're um, it, it, to the extent possible, negotiate a return. You know, say we'll 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 buy this with on a 30-day trial. 
And it, you know, if you're plunking down hundreds of thousands of dollars for hardware, that, that's usually a, that's usually a deal. In the uh, um, in the other um, situation, you're often kind of stuck. You know, with the, if they have the existing hardware, you're not going to walk in and say, you know, that quarter million dollar um, sand you just bought, you need to replace it. You know, that's that does not make you Mr. Popularity. Um, you know, you can run test F sync, although that's you know, if if it comes up with a failure, what do you do? Um, as a consultant, the best I can do is just warn is is just in, um. Well, I'm I'm loud. Um, I is um. Speaking about hardware Speaking about hardware failure. Yeah, um, is the um, the best you can do is strongly encourage them to say, well, if you're not 100% sure of this hardware, what's your backup strategy if it fails? And then they'll usually say, oh, it's a sand is perfect, it never fails, and you know, yeah, all you can do. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see, there was one back there, and then yeah. Well, you know, if it, if well, you you, um, you do have to do some custom scripting. Then, I mean, I um, I'm you know, I, I think dr taking the wall files directly off of the, the master using archive command or something like that seems fine to me. Um, but you know, if if the there is a compared to the secondary. There is one more possible corruption point in that if the wall is written on and and is corrupted in the file system level, then you can't then you know that it's bad it's a bad wall file compared to the replication stream, you know. So there is one more you know there's basically one more image that's been done of it, and so potentially there's another le level of corruption. Maybe naively I don't fully I don't I don't worry about that too much, but um, but it is possible, you know. So. Um, and sir, yeah. Uh, and then. This issue with F sync is this particular to Postgres, or you don't hear much about this in Oracle? Well, it, or, or, um, it's it's true of anything. Um, you know, if if the if it can't harden the data on on disk, it's going to be a problem. Oracle generally generally Oracle installations use Direct IO, which has a different set of you know which which has the same problem. It's just not. It's just the file system's not involved. But. Um, so, but the uh, there's nothing specific to Postgres about it. You know, if if um, the this is a purely operating system level thing. If it, if the um, everything needs to every database in the world needs to at some point have confidence that the operate the I/O operation is done. So, so, so one difference is that because Postgres is not using direct I/O, the amount of time before the data gets written back physically to the disk is likely to be a, a lot longer. Yeah, it's true. That if you do direct I/O and you don't have a working F sync, the data won't be on the platter immediately. But within a small fraction of a second, it probably will be. Whereas with Postgres, the data could sit in the buffer buffer. Yeah, it also cache for a long time. Yeah, it, it also depends on how m many layers of indirection there are between the operating system and the actual platter. So if it's on a SAN and the SAN software says, "Oh yeah, F sync's done," really, truly, it's done. Then you know you're, um, but um, it is a, it is true that Postgres doesn't do direct I/O and it runs on top of the, the file system. So there is so as Robert says there is this uh, additional delay. So but there's nothing. Um, but ultimately, if F sync's not being honored, F sync's not being honored, and that's a problem. Yes. Two, two, two quick things. One is regarding the SANs. Um, they, they they never lose data and until until they do, which often is the point where they lose everything. So. You know, you typically don't want to have your backups or your wall archive on the same sand where you've got your primary data, if at all possible. And I have seen that happen. You know, people get I mean, sand, they think it's reliable, it loses the whole shoot page. The other thing is just as a detail that is an example of why you probably want to use one of the tools that was mentioned for, for your backups rather than rolling your own and, and a, a, an important data point if you do decide to roll your own anyway is that if you create a new file like a copy of a wall file and you f-sync the contents that file is still not guaranteed to be there after a crash unless you f-sync the directory. <laughs> yeah. You know um, we have there was in fact a client who um, we and we were on them for quite a while about this. They had they had a very expensive sand from a major vendor. It was a fiber channel sand. It was all very nice piece of hardware on which they spent a lot of money, 
And every time we would say, well, what if the sand fails? The sand can't fail. Well, what, what's your backup strategy? Oh, well, we do snapshots on the sand. And then they installed, then, then they installed a firmware upgrade and it bricked it. And the sand vendor was unable to recover a single bite off of this. It nearly destroyed the business, and this was a multi-million dollar business. This was a multi-million dollar publicly traded business. Um, so, and their answer to this is, oh well, that was a bad firmware update. And they are still doing the same strategy. There's an emotional issue there that we can't overcome. So just to, just to be clear, I'll continue taking, taking issues, but I'm prioritizing questions rather than comments now, and we can do comments at the end. Yes. Uh, Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, in your experience, how reliable are cloud storages like in Amazon, EBS? Um, the let's see. Generally, extremely reliable. Mm -hmm. um, there, ha uh, um, the the problems I have had with EBS are not that the underlying data being lost, although that has happened occasionally, is that the mount dis that, but sometimes the mount not reattaching properly. But the data is still there. You just have to go in and manually reattach them out. I have a couple of times, which is you know roughly in the grand scheme of things about equivalent to direct attached storage. Had a, an EBS mount, uh, have an EBS mount just go away. I never lost anything out of S3. So, um, so it, uh, generally, uh, that's not my worry. You know, I, I just treat it like a direct attached storage, and you know, consider it. It's it's a it's another storage volume you need to back up. So. Mm -hmm. Lose a bit of data, a bit of recent data. Why would these cases you're describing cause corruption and not readable data rather than just lost data? Well, because what's um, what's going on is at the time that, that it, um, at the time during the power failure, it's it's you know the disk is literally spinning under the heads, and it's trying to write data, and then the power fails and the and the rotation mechanism stops. But the heads are still in place, and, um, and they're supposed to like lift and retract. But that's not a perfect mechanism. So, if the wall is there, it can recover from that because it know because it because um, the the it can because it, it has it the it, can, it will go back replay the wall and reconstruct the bad sectors, which is what Postgres does. But the problem is it hasn't um, it hadn't flushed the wall completely, um, or it hadn't noted that the wall had been flushed. So. Right, because yeah, I mean synchronous commit and F sync really up. I mean, I um, in my were you in my tutorial? No. Okay. Um, I, uh, this is the, 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 this is my mistake because I tend to present them very close to each other as if they are tightly related in some way, but they're not really. It's entire the the synchronous commit case and the F sync off case are really very different underlying. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's the, um, they both, you know, because sometimes you'll have people, including me, and I should stop doing this, say they both have data loss potential, but the data loss is extremely different between the two of them. Synchronous commit is the, you're, you're accepting the fact that when on a crash, you may be farther back in time, but the database will be fine. It won't be corrupt in any, you know, in any, in the sense that Postgres will refuse to start or you'll get errors. Yeah, if, uh, but if you turn off F-Sync or if the underlying hardware is F-Sync, all bets are off. Because Postgres's data integrity assumes that when it comes back from it, when, this, uh, when the operating system level says F-Sync, you know, whatever synchronization primitive, generically F-Sync, um, comes back, then the answer is yes, all the data really is on disk. Yes, sir? If anyone's interested in backups and restores and strategies like that, um, come to this room at lunchtime and we'll have a short. Um, yeah, he, he's like, knows more, than, knows more than I will ever know about backups, so. Um, any, any other questions, first questions? I want to drain the queue of questions before we, okay, yes. I'm just curious, uh, you're talking about four stores with SANS, and I'm wondering uh, anything to do with SANS which use SSDs in particular? 
generally, I haven't, I, honestly, I haven't had a lot of experience with SANs that use SSDs uh, that are fully populated with SSDs. Um, you know, they're, they're ones that have hybrid storage. Generally, um, in, in part because those are really, really, really expensive. And, and, um, so, and most, most uh, organizations that use SANs have partial SSDs as a front end cache, and then the backing store is all spinning disks. Um, SSDs are somewhat more reliable than spinning disks, but I own, but but the operative word there is somewhat. They they any secondary storage must be treated as inherently suspect and wants to kill you. So, you know, every 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 hard drive is thinking of ways to make your life miserable. So, thwart it before it does. Any other questions so that we can just chat until the slot's empty? Um, well, the, if, um, if over the over the replication connection, over the network connection, that you know, assume, you're assuming your your network, you trust your network, yes, you know. But because you, you point out that, for example, if you do a from the state, you get like one, another like like just a. Uh, well, if it's replay, you know, it depends on um, depends on where uh, the origin of that particular wall data. If it's replaying it off of the disk, then you know it's no different than any of it. Um, you know, for example, if it's if you've set wall keep segments high and you've had a disconnect and you're reconnecting it, it's re the back, the primary is replaying it from the wall segments. Not so there is so. Um, yeah, this is this is one of the reasons that I, I kind of like don't specifically worry about corrupt wall information compared to anything else um, because the. Um, because, uh, because it's really not possible to guarantee that it won't be written, that you won't get wall information that was at some point written to the disk. Is there a concept of having a checksum for each data row? Um, each well, it's, it's on the page level, not the, not the row level, but I think that's sufficient. You know, you can... Um, so, so can you trust that then? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, you know, any any ha any hash algorithm has collisions, so you can, in fact, have data corruption. You can have data le page level corruption where the checksum passes. Well, you can, you can also have blocks that were written with complete checksums to the wrong spots. Yeah, I mean, there, you know, you uh, you could, it, 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 you know, any any you know any engineer in thirty seconds could come up with a scenario in which the checksum, you know, reports correct but is not. However. You know, uh, um, it's all a matter of percentages. You know, so uh, at, at that point, at, th at that point, you're probably, you know, it's you're you're approaching near perfect. But the answer is, if you don't like that, restore from your last known good backup. You know, it's um, you the, the there is no there is no perfect there is no certainty this side of the grave on data retention. So it's all a matter of percentages. Well, uh, someone was trying to move from Oracle to Postgres. Is this a well, you don't, 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 sit, don't sit through an entire talk on every bad thing that I've experienced in you know, 15 years of being a Postgres consultant and, and conclude from that Postgres sucks. That's a little bit like going to, you know, is, it's, you know if you're a full-time, it's, you know, it's like to, to a cop, all a, you know, everyone's a criminal, and to a, a doctor, everyone's sick. To a consultant, all, po all databases are problems. Because the no one no one hires me to come in and tell them they're, they're and, and look at their database and coo over it. It's always there's a problem. So you know, don't take for this that Postgres is horrible and is always having corruption. I mean, I did, I did Oracle for more than 15 years, and pretty much everything Chris has shown us here, I've seen on Oracle or similar, like basically yeah. similar yeah. things. Yeah. Hardware fails. And hardware fails. Is sure. as good as the what? Yeah. Think of how many backups you can buy with an Oracle license. Postgres backups you could, how about, yeah. As, as, a, as another data point, I managed 200 databases for six years and had five corruptions and it was all bad hardware. Yeah, yeah. Re remember that I'm a paramedic and so, and, and you're asking a paramedic about automotive safety, you know. <laughs> You know, I have a somewhat jaundiced view of how database about the, the there are millions and millions of very good Postgres installations out there that no one has any trouble with and is never going to spend a dime on me. So, and yay for them. Yes, sir. Uh, maybe a bit outside that, but it's been mentioned here. So I've never heard that about uh, other databases in direct I.O. and Postgres not. Is there a fun more reason for that? Or uh, okay. Talk to, uh, talk to talk them. To yeah. Yeah, talk to him. <laughs> There's, um, the answer is yes. And, uh, and next question. <laughs> Great answer. <laughs>
Yeah, it's right. It's right there. With, uh, if you it, go, just go up and ask them that, or why we don't have a bug tracker. Um, it, the 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 answer the answer may amaze you. Um, any other? Great. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>